I'm Chuck Norris, and I approve this game. Welcome to the Roll for Initiative Podcast. The Roll for Initiative Podcast, volume number three, special insert number six. At least I think so. I'm oh, kidding. Special insert six. I'm sitting alongside DM Matt. Hello, everyone. Oh, yeah, and I'm DM Vince, in case you didn't know. And this week, we have a special guest with us, DM Angelo. Angelo, how are you this week? Hey, what's up, guys? I'm uh, doing doing good. It's, yeah. it's beautiful out here in uh, in Los Angeles. Ah, uh, the City of Angels. Oh, yeah. Spent some time in West Hills myself, so. Oh, that's very close from where I'm at, yes. Oh, really? Cool. Why don't you tell yeah, us? I'm, I'm... Sorry? Go go ahead. I was going to say, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the game and how you, what you do and how you play it? Um. Okay, well, it started way back in, uh, I mean, I think I was in grade school uh, in 1981 uh, at a friend of mine that, uh, had these really cool, flimsy books, and it ended up, ended up being the uh, the the, um, the the basic uh, uh, red box. I think it was the red box back then. I can't remember, but there was the the uh, the, the basic set. We we started playing that, and then a couple months later, got right into. Um, well, I mean, we don't we didn't call it first edition back then, but we uh, um, you know AD and D got the books and and. Uh, we had a, a pretty awesome DM back back uh, when I was younger. I remember the first module we ever you know ever went through was uh, Q1 and uh, made it to that. And ever ever since then I was hooked. And uh, that was such a such a fun um, uh, experience as a, as a, as a player. And uh, it, you know it progressed from there. And I and I, I, I DM'd a, a group of uh, group of guys and gals um throughout the 80s we had a we had a um a uh, pretty awesome campaign that lasted about 10 years until until about 90 93 or so and then i i went on hiatus for uh, got out of the game and came back at uh at, let's say around 2005 and uh um saw that the game had totally changed um from what i remembered and uh uh messed around with third edition for a minute and then jumped into um you know 4e and uh was heavily involved in, uh, for a while in the encounters uh we have a, we have a really awesome gaming store down here where um we do the the weekly encounter stuff and i i was heavily involved in in that for for many years and uh even the the living forgotten realms um, stuff we have a pretty big following down here of that for some of the local conventions and uh, did that for uh, several years too but I say about a year year and a half ago I, I, I just I, I, uh, I kind of got that itch for the old school feel and and, uh, and and I even you know kind of transferred our whole gaming group over to uh, get some of the old books back and we all converted our, our uh, campaign into uh, you know first edition and um, so we do we, I, I'm pretty lucky I have a, I have a group of eight players that I DM that we meet on a weekly basis and uh, it's a face-to-face -face sitting here in my living room it's pretty pretty awesome I know a lot of people don't get that opportunity to to play that and I, and I, I have a great group of, of guys and gals that we uh, we play with it's it's uh, not a hack and slash group um it's they really get really really into the whole role playing aspect of it and uh it's kind of ridiculous sometimes cuz uh we'll we'll play for 4 5 6 7 you know 4 5 6 hours straight without even encountering anything and it's like you guys move forward <laughs> but uh uh it's uh yeah that's that's about where i'm at I, i'm uh, um it's uh that's kind of the history of 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 me Cool. Well, it sounds like you got a nice little setup going, a nice little game going. Good. That's good. Everyone needs to have that in their life. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's funny. We uh, um, I um, 
I don't know if you guys you got well on the on our website. I, I went. I took the one of the last uh, um, adventures I took our group through was uh, some of Todd Hughes's stuff. Um, uh, the, uh, yeah, some he's got some great material. But uh, speaking uh, about Todd Hughes, uh, I've yeah I've seen that on the website too. Recently got in contact with him again, and he will be doing the plus two to save articles again for us. Yay. He'll be continuing. He did put another one up uh, just the other day. I think it was called Dead Man Walking. Yes, it was. Yes. I would tell you more about it, but, you know, the site locked me out today, so I can't get into it. So, Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Matt's working on fixing that so I can get back into the website. So, uh, yeah. Producer and uh, owner of the stuff can't even get into it, but whatever. Yes. I'm the technical guru, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I, I don't bother with that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I do it. <laughs> So anyway, we thank Todd for coming back. As soon as I can get back in there, I'm going to put up a little area that has his that highlights just his articles. But I did make some changes to the website for newer people. I uh, started doing a frequently asked questions, uh, frequently asked questions page, and as well as as soon as you log in on the right hand side, it'll show you. Uh, I'm doing this from memory. It says new to AD and D first edition. It has volume one. Talks about our first issue. Talks about the uh, primer on old school gaming that Matt Finch had written uh, a while ago, probably 2007, I think it was. Not positive about that. Uh, I know he wrote it a while ago, but it's uh, it's good. And also looking to find books, we have our volume one issue two that Jason and I did way back in 2009 and resources for buying it as well as I tried to organize it a little bit better. So that's that. Uh, let's see what we have on tap here. Uh, oh, the classic shirt is back for the Roll for Initiative podcast. is on the website. A lot of people were asking about that classic shirt that we used to have. Oh, we brought it back. The one I won on issue 17. Yeah, the one that Matt won and wound up becoming part of the show with. Yes. So get your own shirt now. Maybe you too can be part of the show. It re- You have to have the shirt, though. <laughs> yeah, you have to buy the shirt to take over Matt's job. That's it. You get to have the Matt shirt. It says Matt on the side. Yep. Has a nice little name tag like the uh, gas station attendant. Habib, yeah, that's what it says on <laughs> it. Uh, yeah, so that's the shirt. That's that. And we do have some voicemails this week we want to go over real quick. So let me just pull that up. Greetings, RFI gurus. This is DM Kojo. Hey, I just uh, was listening to She Wants Well and the discussion you guys had in the Sage Advice about spell scrolls. So it got me thinking that I should research this because I just wasn't sure how this works. So I've never had players that wanted to make scrolls. So I did a little digging and I uh, wanted to broaden the, the topic if I could. I know you guys talked about the right spell on page 69 of the player's handbook. And in my reading of the spell, it says that by means of the spell, Magic Fusion might be able to inscribe a spell he or she cannot understand at that time due to level. For lack of sufficient, and I would assume that's the spell book. So the right spell, you have to cast a spell, and then you have the saving throws that come into play, as you guys discussed it. So it looks like that's specifically for, not for making scrolls so much as copying a spell into your spell book that you can't currently understand. So that when you reach a sufficient level to cast it, it's already in your book. Um, so that could be handy, instead of lugging around a bunch of books of spells you can't cast yet. I did find on the player's handbook, page 25, it says, under the description of the magic user, when a magic user attains 11th level, wizard level, or higher, he or she may enchant items or survive magic scrolls. Um, and then goes on to explain more detail about that. But uh, it looks to me that uh, um, you know lower level wizard or uh, magic users below the wizard name level. <laughs> wouldn't be able to create scrolls per se. Um, although you could argue that the right spell could be used that way, I suppose. But uh, uh, then be out there. One other thing I thought uh, worth mentioning, although I know not everybody uses the rule in the Unearthed Arcana, but I do. And on page 80 of the Unearthed Arcana, there is a topic casting spells directly from books. Uh, it says that... Uh, DM may allow magic user to cast a spell directly from any sort of spell book as if it were a scroll. Um, the caster must be able to know and use the spell in question, so we can rule out anything that was copied in with the right spell. 
Uh, direct casting of the spell from a spellbook automatically destroys the spell, as Nick mentioned before. There's also a 1% chance per level of the spell that the spell immediately preceding and following the spell cast will likewise be destroyed. There's an additional 1% chance that the casting of a spell directly from a spellbook will destroy the entire book. So I thought that was uh, interesting there. Um, extra rule obviously added in the Unearth Arcana if you want to play with that. So just uh, like to hear your guys' thoughts on some of those details and more discussion on scrolls. It's always been kind of a, a nebulous thing to me as my players just don't really typically try to get them or use them. So your thoughts are much appreciated. Keep up the great work. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Well, thank you, Game Kojo, for writing, uh, writing and we're calling in like you normally do, and we love that, and we appreciate that, and keep calling in. And you dove into that uh, right spell big time there. I've always been using that uh, trick of when you read it from the uh, book, it fades away. I just never did the penalties. Even before the you know, Arcana came out, that was a, a DM Joe thing, so... He kind of used that. Yeah. yeah, I've never actually, I've never actually used the reading from the spell book before, and I'm not even sure if my current players even know they can. So I might bring that up to our magic user to see if I can tempt him to burn some spells from his book. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It'd be like, oh, you don't have any spells? Well, you have your spell book. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think my my uh, players know that either. But uh, that's that's uh, it's, it's kind of terrible if it if uh, if it goes all bad. So <clears throat> not a problem. Well, thank you, Kojo, and we do have some. Uh, let's see here, two um, emails, RFI staff at gmail dot com. First one comes from John Williams. No one's gonna wow. on the name. Or <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for some wow. John Williams. Mm-hmm. He plays too. Wow. <laughs> I was listening to the older episodes of the show and caught up with one of the listener submitted modules. Have these modules been made available to download yet? If so, where can I get them? Go right to our website if it's functioning for you and go to issue number 103, volume number three, right on the front page. It says, and the winners are, I believe, Matt titled it, right? Yes. And it has the links to the winning module as well as the rest of them zipped up. I think they were zipped up at least. Yeah, they were. All, uh, I actually compiled them into one handy dandy PDF. There you go. So, and these will also be in the show notes. I'll put a link in the show notes to the modules. Again. For this one. Again, yes. And you can also, if our website isn't functioning for you, uh, you can also go to the OSR gaming forums. <laughs> And find the show notes to all of our shows there as well. And many more. Yes, many, many more. Yes, as uh, all the shows should be up now on uh, iTunes because I went through the whole entire server on RFI and re-uploaded them and made sure to put them by volume so everyone could find them a lot easier. Right. So you should find them. And there's also a handy nifty thing on the side that says Volume 1, Volume 2, and Current Issues. So you can just find out which one you want and hit play right there. Awesome. Makes it a lot easier. I did I did Matt's job this time. Yes, so. he did. He uh-huh. did He did my job, and very well. <laughs> <laughs> and then I broke the website. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's why we can't have nice websites. Yeah. Oh, well. Shut up. Uh, so we got our last uh, email coming in here. And this one's, hi, RFI guys. I love your show, and it has brought me a wealth of information and great ideas for my games. I have a few questions. Question number one. Attacks of opportunity in first edition. Do they exist? How do they work? Etc. Nope. (laughs) Question number one. Yeah, that's it. No, they do not. I will will give the Steve Jobs answer to the questions. Nope. That's how (laughs) you respond to people's emails. One word answers, nope. Yup. (laughs) Yup. No, attacks of opportunity do not exist in first edition. That was a third edition thing. You can rule as a DM that if a player is running past a monster or somebody that's attacking them and they're aware of it, you can say that person may have an attack chance against them, but there's no hard set rule for that. Yeah. It's kind of a house rule if you want to use it or not. It's up to you. Yeah. Really, yeah, the yeah, only did. time I would probably do is if, like, I was using morale and someone failed their morale save and just started running away in terror. Then I think you can get a free shot. 
Otherwise, just moving away though, especially considering the time frame of a round in first edition, it, considering it's a minute, I think within a minute you could successfully defend yourself and step away five feet. Yeah, probably. So yeah, e- easily, easily. I, I think it, I think what it is is uh, it, it uh, just common sense. You know, it, it doesn't have to be no hard line rule that. Uh, oh, you're pulling away. Oh, you're going to get a, he's going to get a free attack on you. I think it's it's common sense. You just think about the situation and it alters, you know, per situation or per, you know. Right. What feels doesn't, right. It doesn't it, Yeah, what feels right. There you go. That's couldn't have said it better that. There you go. Yeah, cuz if it feels right to you, it's probably going to feel right to the players. Yeah. Yes, and if it doesn't feel right, tell an adult. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Oh <laughs> Question number two. Yeah, I know that. that's wrong, But anyway, it just fit really wow. well. Question number two. Have you ever done a show on nautical adventures, like sailing around on a ship to islands and stuff? Yeah, I think we did. I'm think... pretty sure we did. To the show notes. Way, yeah, way way back. Yeah, I remember hearing that. Volume one. That was uh, during the Jason era. We did one of that. I could have sworn we did that. Let's see here. Oh, I can't think of any anything else. Uh, thanks for your great show, DM Benjamin. It would so, be issue 39, water, water everywhere, and a D20 to drink. Yes. Mm. That's yeah. back when we had clever titles for our shows. Yes. <laughs> yes, the, the, Jason was far better at naming shows than me. By the time I'm done editing a show, my brain is kind of mush, so therefore I don't have the uh, witty uh, names that he would. Well, that's okay. We excuse you. Yeah. You have to the show so that's yeah <laughs> yes yeah, so it was like the last show that i wasn't on uh the runtime was two hours and 45 minutes i think i finished <laughs> editing it in five hours <laughs> so speaking about that let's uh crack out n2 and redo that or no <laughs> yes. Odd, that show yes it, it was a great set of random encounters yeah <laughs> as for a module i don't know we were laughing so hard on it yeah <clears throat> Anyway, uh, so that's pretty much Sage Advice. If you'd like to give us a call, 570-865-4210, the hotline, where the uh, the druids of the great ye old forest are standing by from N2. Wow. And if you're nice, they'll give you a potion. Maybe. <laughs> or they might give you another potion. Right. Or three. I wonder if they have a potion to fix our website. No, I, I fixed it. I'm back in again. I awesome. Just the cookie must have worked. <laughs> yes. Anyway, but, so what, Matt? I said, but beware, you might run into some baboons. <laughs> yes. Yeah, baboons. Yes. In the middle of the cave. Maybe it was the baboons that messed up our website. No. <laughs> the internet baboons. So by the time this comes out, WrestleMania have happened, I would assume. Right, Matt? Yeah. Yes. It'll probably be edited the day after WrestleMania. Oh, well. Yes. So uh, most people like to hear our predictions about wrestling and hear our wrestling talk. Let's do our predictions right now, Matt. Let's give it out there real quick. Uh, Okie doke. Do the rundown. Let's start with the intercontinental match, Wade Barrett versus The Miz. I'm going to say Miz is walking away with this one. I'm going to go Miz as well. Okay. It'll be the standard status quo there. Yeah. Uh, Let's go to one of the heavy matches, Ryback versus Mark Henry. I'm seeing a Ryback win here because Vince McMahon is trying to reinvent Goldberg, so he's going to try to push him as much as he can. Right. Ryback needs the win. Mark Henry, he's kind of where he's always going to be. So, Whereas Ryback, if he doesn't win, it kind of really derails him because they've been beating him a lot lately. Yeah. And uh, that's what Mark Henry do. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be a big match a cl- with lots of clubbering. <laughs> clubbering time. Tag Team Champions, Hell No versus Dolph Ziggler and Biggie Langston. I'm going to say that Hell No is going to take that one because Dolph has bigger and better things to do, especially with that damn briefcase. Well, I'm thinking they'll actually put the belts on him and Biggie, then have Dolph cash in on Alberto get the, and, and get that belt, then AJ will win the uh, women's belt from Caitlyn on, like, Raw the day after Mania or something. So that way they'll have, like, a whole bunch of belts. Interesting. Yeah, 
that have the Kurt Angle thing with the shopping cart and the uh, belts walking to the ring. Yeah, sort of like the uh, and- Ultimo Dragon after he won the uh, Super Juniors tournament. He had to walk around with eight belts. <laughs> yeah. So we got Randy Orton, Sheamus, Big Show versus The Shield. I'm calling The Shield on a win for this because they're still building The Shield up to be the next NWO with Kevin Nash behind it. I'm guaranteeing that. Yes, I I have actually worked independent shows with uh, Dean Ambrose here in Cincinnati because he actually is from the area. I would say. Yeah, and I will say The Shield will win as well, and um, I wouldn't be shocked to see uh, Randy Orton heel turn. Really? Yep. And well, you're basing that on what? I um, Orton's been wanting to go heel forever, and it just seems it would seem like to be a good time to do it. So that way, uh, Orton can blame everyone else on the blame Sheamus, blame Big Show for the loss, and be like, uh, "Screw you guys, have an RKO." <laughs> well, Big Show's kind of in that state of being bad slash good anyway right now. Yeah. I don't but, know which one he's heading. So. Uh, World Heavyweight Championship, Alberto Del Rio. Anyway, versus Jack. <laughs> Thwaggle. Weed, Jack Weed the People Swagger. <laughs> uh, I'm calling Jack Swagger on this one because, well, I think he kind of deserves it. Yeah, I'm going to say Del Rio because um, who is Dolph going to cash that stupid briefcase on? It's not going to be Jack Swagger, and it's not going to be John Cena when he beats The Rock. Well, that that we'll get to in a second, but uh, I was thinking that, that Dolph is going to cash in on Jack Swagger because Jack's going to win the belt and be so exhausted, Dolph could just throw the briefcase in, boom, betray another but, bad guy betraying a bad guy, and maybe based upon the reaction, he can go either way as in a face or a heel. So uh, I don't... The thing with the Swagger character, I don't. I see that having a short shelf life. Um, considering some legal issues he had a month or so ago, the only reason Swagger is actually on this show is because Glenn Beck talked about him on his radio show. Weed the people. Anyway. Yes, weed <laughs> the people. That's right. <laughs> Triple H versus Brock Lesnar in the no hole bars match. If Lesnar wins, Triple H must retire. Lesnar's gonna lose. <laughs> I would, I would say Triple H, but uh, an idea that I've heard, I not just like someone threw out, but not that it's actually been rumored they were doing this. Is since Shawn Michaels is going to be in Triple H's corner, yeah. Shawn Michaels ends up super kicking Triple H, costing him the match. It's playing off of the promo. Uh, that Sean did Monday saying how Brock doesn't respect you when I lost my match. I, I lost it to someone that respects me that won't rub it in my face. So Sean will be like, here's a super kick. Now you could say I'm the one that cost you. I'm not going to rub it in your face. And that way next year at WrestleMania 30, they can have like an unsanctioned match. I don't know. Isn't listeners contract up after this? Uh, he signed for two years. Ugh, I can deal with him for another year. Uh, next year at Mania, they're talking Rock and Brock. <laughs> anyway, okay, so you're calling Triple H as a loss. I'm calling Red Lesnar as a loss. Okay. Yep. Undertaker versus CM Punk. After the <laughs> CM Punk has been doing some really funny crap. Like, yes. He's been making me laugh with the Paul Bearer imitations. Even though it's pretty disrespectful, it's still very funny, though. Yeah. I'm calling... Punk's going to end the streak, no, definitely. No. So it's time to pass the torch. No, nope, not, uh, not the Punk. It, Taker, that's the one thing that will never get broken. Taker's going to keep it. I don't know, dude. I don't know. I just I think it's time to pass the torch. and no. see him. I wouldn't be surprised if the, it's just something screwy happens with the urn and Paul Bearer ends up costing CM Punk the match. It just... It, <laughs> CM Punk is right now the top heel, and what would make him even more of a top heel? Ending the Undertaker streak. Uh, that, that's the one thing that just doesn't... He doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. Yeah, but imagine that under his belt of annoyance as he comes to the arena being the top heel. But the typically the way WWE goes with their shows, you can watch the last Raw... Whoever was standing tall over their opponent in the last Raw before a pay-per-view is probably going to lose. That's typically how they do shows. Well, so, the Undertaker was standing tall, I thought, in the last No. Uh, at the end, P- 
punk came out and beat him with the urn and pulled poured the ashes of Paul Bearer all over him. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so if it's only a- if only punk wasn't straight edge, they could have actually had him smoking the ashes. Yeah. Yeah. That's really disrespectful. Cool. Yeah. And the final, The Rock versus John Cena. I, I have to say John Cena because he needs to get his cred back. Yep. It'll be John Cena. Even though at Extreme Rules, The Rock will be wrestling. He will? Yeah. Yeah, it's come out that The uh, Rock will be at Extreme Rules, and so will Brock Lesnar. So they're mm-hmm. going to have both of them again on a, uh, another pay-per-view. So I guess that's the WrestleMania predictions. Let's see who's right and who's wrong. Yes, especially considering we disagreed on a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that'll end that segment. It's not a new segment. Don't worry, folks. It's just, right. it's just a WrestleMania segment. Let's head into the Table Matters part of the show. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world. I like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. Table manners. Uh, what we're going to talk about this week is we're going to revisit a topic some people have been asking a lot about is uh, how to bring your tavern to life, what to do to make the tavern more of a friendly atmosphere for your players to want to hang around in as opposed to just let me go in there and get the information I need and let me roll a couple dice, blah, 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 stupid tavern, give me a drink type of stuff. So some of the things I've done in my taverns are – try to describe the music that's playing in the background, try to have uh, a bar, bar people and, the, and their barmaids, have them give them names, give them personalities. You don't have to actually like role play out people, but give them some names. Let the players get to know the right. characters in the game a little bit better. Also try to hold games as well. So the, what's the best thing to do in a tavern? You want to drink, you want to eat, you want to gamble. Right. So uh, I've devised a bunch of games to the tavern other than throwing darts. I got I came up with this 3D6 kind of poker type game. There was actually isn't there in the DMG something about uh tavern games and ga- gambling. Uh, I I believe there is, but I I've never used it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's basically is talked about how to resolve all your typical parlor games via dice roll so you don't actually have to whip out the poker deck to play a hand of poker or darts or Mine was you You just take 3d6, whoever was playing, and you roll 3d6, one being the lowest, six being the highest, and whatever the combinations you get, that would be based on the poker rules. So you can get a straight, you can get pairs, you get three of a kind, or you could just get straight numbers across, the highest number wins. Uh, if you get 666, six, six, that is pretty much the royal 3k flush, I call it, and you would be the ultimate winner for that Three ones would also win as well as a six six six, but uh, anything else is like triplets or three of a kind. Yeah, yeah, I'd have fun with that. Yeah, yes, you have to remember yeah. that a tavern in a lot of the towns that is the main focal point for entertainment, food, and anyone that passes through. So it's kind of like a, a center focal point of the culture of the city. So and that would be reflected in both who's at the tavern, the t- the quality of the establishment. Is it run down? Is it well kept? And also j- what type of entertainment they would have. Would they actually have a band? Or would they have like maybe a lone minstrel in the corner no one's listening to? Or perhaps they have elaborate stage shows. <laughs> More like a dinner theater. It all depends on who the owner is. Is it the uh, a local... Uh, right. scamp that's just trying to make his way in the world, or is it by like a local aristocrat? I mean, it's just all, all things to consider. But you want to have a barmaid, you want to have a tavern owner, you want to have a bartender, you want to have a cook, you want to have people in the tavern, you want to make it seem like there's people chatting in the tavern, so you're going to want to have them talking about things that's going to interest the characters in the adventure, so random count not random account, uh, rumors would be the right. best thing to start shouting out one by one right uh because they'll be discussing the rumors the news of the day and it's a, just a great way to throw out a ton of little potential plot hooks to see what your players may latch on to because if you have maybe three or four different potential hooks 
and players walk into a new town in a tavern, they'll hear all of them and you'll see which one sparks their interest. So that way they're directing your story without it actually, but you gave them the choices. Right. What do you, what do you do, Angelo? You know, it's funny that, uh, um, oh, and by the way, the, the, the gambling portion was on page, uh, 215 of the DMG, just the two fifty. Okay. Yeah. 215 There's a couple columns, but, uh, yeah, it's funny that, uh, you know, a lot of my games, they either uh, begin, end, or occur in a tavern. And, and uh, you know, anywhere from, you know, it's really fun is when you have a, a have a, a, an animated bard that's in the group. And, uh, oh, God, that's, uh, that's uh, at least with our group, um, we have one particular bard that just loves to break out in song and get paid. And, <laughs> and uh, oh, it's, 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 it's crazy sometimes. But, uh, um you know, uh, one one thing that you're talking about plot hooks is, uh, you know, billboards and and uh, signs and stuff on the on the bar. Not only the people at at the bar or the tavern uh, talking, but a great place for plot hooks and and uh, and. Uh, um, but, but I I agree with you guys. You know, one 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 thing um, possibly too is you know where is it if it's a big city where within the city is is this tavern or this inn, and that's really going to you know. Uh, um, determine the quality of the inn, whether, you know, what, what's being served there, uh, the, the seediness of the people or et cetera. So God, there's so much you can do with the, with the, with the uh, uh, tavern slash inn. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, sky's the limit on that. And we gathered up some links. I have the Mithril Mages link, which is a tavern inn and pub name generator. I threw up for you, Matt, for the link up there in your, yeah. your window. And I generated quickly some names, and like they have the Merry Eagle, the Haunted Chef, yeah. right. the Ancient Server Inn, the Lord Inn, just to some names to go over. And there's also a uh, tavern tile designer, which you can, was uh, by uh, Zero One Games. Uh, it was a PDF, which allows you to, uh, it's a six by six tile, which you can customize with Adobe Acrobat by turning on and off different layers inside the. Uh, the Adobe, and you can design your own in based on that. So it's kind of a neat thing. It was only about ten bucks. I don't know if it's even for sale anymore. It might be. I'm looking to see. Uh, yeah, drive through RPG. Okay, you can get the drive through RPG. And there's also a tavern tile designer, which is the update. Okay, so there it is, the update by uh, Zero One Games, ten dollars. Same thing. They just updated with more features and. They give you a little example of how you can put tables and bars and some pretty neat little maps they got out of it here. Yeah. Yeah. And something else to remember when it comes to naming your taverns, a lot of them will not actually have signs out front that say the name. It'll just be a picture of the name because back then a lot of people can't read. So if you are the Red Dragon Inn, you're not going to write out Red Dragon. You're just going to put a picture of a Red Dragon out front. Well, yeah, a lot of people couldn't write or read. So exactly. That's so a good point. so or sometimes maybe it was supposed to be a black swan, but due to the poor artist rendition, it's now called the Ugly Duck. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you can do have all kinds of fun with that, or maybe they have a coat of arms of the family that runs it, if they're a more higher class. And then you can even get into maybe different guilds have certain bars they frequent as well. So, like, this is where all the uh, thieves go hang out, or this is where all the mages go hang out after a day of reading books. Yay. <laughs> exactly. Yes, that's <laughs> what everyone needs, a bunch of drunken magic users. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, one thing too is is uh, given the history, uh, like what you guys were saying, is uh, given the history behind uh, the establishment it, it, to the players, or or um, it's one thing to kind of will give some substance to it, and also uh, describing in detail what kind of foods are being served and and uh, um, you know the general vibe of the place and the the the, the feel of the place, and and uh, yeah, you can you can really achieve a lot by, by painting, you know, um, what's, what's going on there. And, and with those little minor details, you know? Right. Yeah. Because that's something that, uh, I think a lot of times, uh, 
DMs just gloss over is the food. You're like, oh, yeah, here's some bread. Here's some soup or meat or whatever. Yeah. Give it more flavor and not mm-hmm. just the taste of the food, but flavor in the variety. Maybe uh, perhaps this restaurant has a specific uh, – this inn or tavern has a specific uh, specialty. Uh, a lot of times maybe the uh, barkeep's also a brewer, so he has his own special brew exactly. ale. Uh, just little things like that can bring it to life more. And also just the – from – just how is it, the layout? Is it more of an open area where well lit? Is it dark it, with a lots of tables and corners for guys in cloaks to sit waiting for someone to approach them? <laughs> it so it's just think of the ambi yeah like Angelo was saying think of the ambiance describe yeah. that and yeah. think of the patrons. Well, I keep when we're talking about this, I keep thinking of. Cheers. Think of the bar cheers. Think norm. of Norm, exactly. Perhaps that tavern has <laughs> yeah. its norm. That tavern yeah. has its Cliff Cleveland. And you exactly. can and then all of a sudden now you have these little NPCs that are probably have no influence on the greater story of your campaign, but give it that extra touch of flavor, extra touch of of uh, realism that just sucks players in more because it the world feels alive. And just like if you had like, well, this tavern's run by a family and they have their kids working as servers and the wife's in the kitchen while the husband's brewing and the oldest son's working the counter. And there's a you can just develop a lot of different characters and you never know when your players may latch on to one and all of a sudden they're wooing the daughter like, oh, the uh, fighter's trying to make a new female friend. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, it's also good to generate a random chart of things that happen in the end, like bar fights, or you could roll if the players are just sitting there. You could say 1d6, one being a bar fight, two being two people start arguing, three, some people start singing drunkly a song, and four, this, and five, that, and six, I ran out of ideas. But you know, if someone <laughs> spills a drink on you, at which point, what do you, and everyone's laughing, what do you do? Just. Yeah, little things like that. I love to do the whole the bar's crowded and then you notice that someone's picking your pocket. You see a little halfling thief grab your gold and try to run away with it. Yep. I've that done al- that before. That always stirs up the group a lot, so especially if they're sitting there doing nothing. Right. It's a way to kind of force the players to start interacting with the world if they just kind of sit there with their thumbs up their butt. <laughs> Pretty disgusting, Matt. Well, sometimes Ouch. players do it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to push them along. Right. Usually at that point, you have the person run in with what you want them to do, and by that, usually they're ready to go. So Yeah. Help, I need your help. And then most of the players are usually good will help, but, you know, yeah. let's get that one. Yes, yeah, so the person stumbles into the crowded bar and goes up to this specific table and says, you're my only hope. You have to do... X now, or like in the N two module, the the old guy stumbles in and says, "You have to help us." Right. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, I have a bunch of potions for you. Yeah, if you do it. <laughs> and we did find out that Carl Smith is a real person that does exist. He uh-uh. was. We found out he worked for Pace Center Games. I think it was. I don't know somewhere okay. around Florida. But he does exist, so he is a real person who is responsible for that module. <laughs> So uh, we are demanding him be brought to justice. No, <laughs> kidding. I like to hear his take on that. Though. Right. I when I read, I did read through the module, and I'm as I'm reading, I'm like, this is just a seems like a bunch of individual encounters, someone shoehorned together to try to make a story. Like, yeah, that's what I kept saying. It sounds like it was a bunch of things that were submitted to Dragon that they never put in Dragon. And they said, hey, let's make a module out of it and see how much money we can make. <laughs> they should have called it Dragon Stew. <laughs> no, they should have called it Dog Crap is what they should have called it. <laughs> I don't like it. Yeah, I, I definitely would, would like to hear uh, a back tale about how and why or and what that, that was, you know, that module was brought about. 
Cause uh, it, it definitely, I have that. I had that same exact. You know, you before I even the show, I even looked at some of the reviews on it, and wow, people just really ripped into that. Um, before you got, before you guys even did a review on it, but um, yeah, it seems like it was just a cluster of some maybe uh, dungeon magazine uh, uh, encounters or something along those lines. Just uh, you know, you can use a lot of. Pe- I wouldn't use the whole the whole module, but I definitely would, you know, pull some ideas out of it. But, uh, yeah, as far as trudging through the whole module, wow. Maybe it was know. the first module written entirely by random chart. <laughs> oh, God. Maybe it was written by, like, that uh, – you ever see that episode of uh, South Park when they made fun of the family guy? Oh, yes, the uh, <laughs> manatees with the balls. Yeah, they just push oh, the balls into random slots to make a pilots for the sh- uh, plots for the show. <laughs> Well, wow. the best thing you could steal from that module actually is the tavern. Speaking of taverns, yeah, yeah. that whole setup. Maybe change it. Don't make the owner of the tavern such a moron. They didn't realize thieves in his own place <laughs> after being a former thief. Right. Uh, what you yeah, do I is found you. That, I found that kind of weird. Yeah, um, that that would even be going on without this person that was you know had to at some point be. Um, pretty knowledgeable about those kind of arts and it going on in his own tavern i mean it's kind of kind of weird yeah i'm just trying to figure out how would he not hear the massive construction work going on to create this (laughs) elaborate secret door system i i that's one of the questions that that nick and i were like how does he not know this but whatever yeah, that was yeah. That's kind of a, a little far fetched. Uh, I try to I try to keep a little bit of uh, common sense in a game with uh, like you say, dragons and fairies. But uh, yeah, that's really wow. That did not make sense to me either. Yeah. So, do you have any more tips we can throw in there, uh, Angelo, for making a tavern? You know, you know, my my big thing, like I was, uh, like I said before, was uh, I, I really want to describe what's going on there, not just like, hey, okay, you enter, you enter a tavern or you enter an inn. Okay, what do you guys do? Well, let's go talk to the blah blah blah. Uh, you know, I want to give the the innkeeper or the barkeep or the um, whatever else, whoever else is working there, I want to give them some 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 substance, some oomph, and uh, you know, describe them a little bit, maybe give them a. little uh, uh, one of them's got a, 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 a amputated leg from, uh, or, or, uh, wears a patch or, or, you know, uh, you know, whatever, just give some substance to some of these people and, and, you know, put some stories. You know, what I really liked about some of the old school modules was the rumors and, 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 um, uh, randomly remember some of the older modules, you'd be able to randomly roll, um, some rumors. Well, uh, adding those to to a game, if you prepare or 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 hijack from another module some some you know some uh, uh, flavored uh, rumors, that's that's another way to do it. But I, I I'm really big on describing stuff and uh, um, giving the giving the players a visual aid by my words to them. You know what I mean? Because it's not just oh you're gonna enter enter this this uh, establishment. What does it look like? I mean, is there are there there is there uh, 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 what, what's, you know, what, what's, what's going on there for real. It's not, well, not just, uh, you know, your standard stuff. So, um, it, there's so much stuff you can do too. And it just, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's yeah. plenty of random generators out there for you to find to help you generate your tavern. If you're just that lazy and don't feel like doing it, which I know yeah. DMs just not really lazy, but they just don't feel like doing it. And if they feel it's such a small part of the, the game that who cares? So, yeah, for for me, uh, in my home uh, Ravenloft campaign, I'm actually considering making a tavern and having that be its own little pocket domain, be- oh. where the the actual uh, uh, owner proprietor is the actual uh, big bad you have to deal with. And my inspiration was actually I'm a big fan of the book Devil in the White City about the. Uh, 1893 World's Fair in Chicago and the serial killer that was also H.H. H. Holmes that was going on killing people at the same time. And he actually built a giant three-story what they called a castle. It was like uh, basically what would be considered a large inn. The two floors, the top two floors were rooms people could rent. The bottom floor had businesses and like a, a pharmacy and whatnot. And 
but that the levels two and three were like a maze with mm-hmm. like blind corners, doors that if you open, there was nothing behind them, and other door, and it was just a really odd layout that made people get really disoriented. One of the rooms was actually a bank <laughs> vault. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the rooms was actually a bank vault that he had built into the building. So if someone went into it, he could just seal it off and kill them that way. And he, I, wow. but so I'm thinking of subjecting my players to base H H Holmes castle, but in Ravenloft. Why not go for it? Exa- like a idea. Wow. Exactly. Because at that point that no one ever expects the uh, innkeep to be, the big bad. He's always a friendly chap who gives them direction and gives them, sells them food. Well, well never, now everyone's going to suspect that, Matt. Great. Thank <laughs> yes. <laughs> now everyone will sleep with one eye open every night, <laughs> even if they have a locked door. <laughs> the best is when players go to an inn and uh, the characters just say players. That'd be kind of weird. Yeah. They go in and they get their room. They like lock it down. They look for secret doors and you still have somebody come into the room just to mess with them. Yes. Uh, where rats? That, that's, <laughs> yeah. Where- that, that, that sounds like a great, a great uh, place to put it though. Is in a, in a Ravenloft setting though. Yeah. That sounds like, I mean, that sounds like it could go there perfectly. So well, you're a serial killer. Or does he go with people with lucky charms or cookie crisp? Uh, oh no he he's all about the frankenberry oh awesome yeah Yeah. he's going old school random limited serial people huh oh yeah absolutely i you can actually find if you just search hh holmes castle uh find the maps the layout of the his castle and it is just bizarre the layout and i think it would just make a great it's just something totally different from what a player would expect of a, a random inn. Not to mention there's trap doors that go down to a basement furnace and just all kinds of little side doors. It would be a perfect place for the were rats because they would already have had the secret passages built into it for them to steal things. Please, let's not bring up that module anymore. <laughs> It just, it's so, yeah, you, uh, you know, one thing uh, I forgot to mention, too, is as far as layouts and, uh, uh, you know, visual aids for, for a tavern or an inn, uh, the, the program SketchUp, if you guys have ever used it. Um, oh, yeah, the Google. Some, yeah. Oh, my God, there's so many really cool. Uh, I mean, if you get pretty good at, at doing uh, creating buildings and settings with it, you can make some really awesome stuff. But if you just search for some of the, uh, the things that people have made and utilize and hijack some of the stuff that people have, have made and, and, and kind of show your players, um, well, this is, this is what it looks like. And, and they see it in a, a 3d visual representation. It's, you know, kind of, I guess could probably help a little bit too. I've utilized that sometimes in, in, uh, um, small little, you know, um, um, small villages and stuff like that, showing them the layout like that. But that's another way, to, I guess, to to, to yeah. bring more life into it. Cool. Yeah. When is your next Ravenloft game, Matt? Um, the next one, well, will probably be in two weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're t- uh, normally we game on Sundays, but it's going to be WrestleMania, so I won't that's be nice. there. Yeah. Ooh. Um, Ooh. but our last game, they're actually in the village of. Oh dare the uh, where the oh dare yes the domain where the uh, marionettes kill people. Oh okay, nice. yeah. Well, I, I took that but put a children of the corn spin on it, <laughs> so that way all wow. the children are actually taken care of by the puppets, and they look up to the puppets. And once the children get a certain age, they kill them off, and the children are all okay with this because, uh. The main evil puppet has basically convinced them all that once you hit a certain age, you go mean and try to kill children. <laughs> wow. Sounds like an M. Shyamalan when I'm whatever movie. <laughs> yeah. Night Shyamalan. That's what I meant to say. Yes, M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong. Yeah. It sounds like one of his really weird movies. No, that would be if I revealed that to the players they were actually nothing more than SCA members. <laughs> And there was actually like giant construction machines building an amusement park around them. Oh, okay. And everything was fake. Exactly. <laughs> and you were a ghost. Yes. <laughs> That's the whole plot of all those movies. Yeah. 
Yeah, my next game is going to be this. Well, will be past Saturday by the time you listen to this. It'll be Chapter Two: of the Tyranny of Asmodeus, as they now go into the Shadowlands to find the next beacon of power to destroy it. So that should be fun. And also, I'm running an online game of Men in Black real soon. Oh, how's that? The D6. Oh, it hasn't started yet. We're going to be rolling up characters. Okay. Yeah, because I've I've heard of the system, but I've never actually played in it. That's what's. It's the West End game system. D6. Oh, okay. It's uh, the D6. Okay. Very, very simple to play. It should be a lot of fun. So cool. I'm going to try to record that just to throw it up so people can hear it. So I'm much interested in old school gaming. So Right. <sighs> so I guess that's going to end the show this week. Mm. No? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you want to go, Matt? Did you want to say something else? Or? Oh, no. Uh, what did you do? The burp? Or what the heck was that? <laughs> you see, I'm trying the new Kickstart Mountain Dew energy drink. So that was like just biological noises from consuming an energy drink rapidly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, you, call, or you can contact us, RFI staff at gmail.com. 570-865-4210, the hotline. DM Angelo, thank you for joining us this week. We appreciate you coming on the show and giving us your two cents. Thank you. And uh, all you fans out there, if anyone's interested in just coming in for a guest hosting, let us know. Give us an email or if I staff at gmail.com and we'll work out the details. This is Vince for Matt and Angelo saying good night, everybody, and keep those dice rolling really cool. I don't know. Keep Rizzle, keep it old school. Good night. Good night. Good night. Roll for initiative.